America, a new world, the hope of many peoples from many lands looking for freedom and a new way of life. Here was the promise of fulfillment for an elusive dream. They came with diverse backgrounds and heritages and formed a revolutionary concept in government, American democracy. Led by the office of the presidency and the men who have filled that office, this government, across two centuries of growth and crisis, has emerged in our own time as first power of the world. The power vested in the office of presidency has led us to our present state of world leadership. But there comes a time when such enormous authority may seem to clash with the public will. What happens then? With our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Many today question whether the President of the United States has not been granted too much power. The Commander-in-Chief Clause gives the President so much power that the limits of the Constitution have been but swallowed up by it. Decades, the President's been able to sell anything he wants to the American people by saying he doesn't have time to consult I used Congress. to believe that a President could go only so far. I don't believe that anymore. Where does the President get all this uncontrolled power that it seems to be able to take us into wars without our having any vote or say in the matter and may even lead us into some sort of nuclear catastrophe? Well, I, I think there's more to it really than that. Hubert Humphrey has probably more. come closer to the presidency than any other human being except the presidents themselves. His public career encompasses service of mayor of a large city, then in the United States Senate, then as vice president. After his defeat for the nation's highest office in 1968, he returned to the classroom from which he had emerged in 1945 this time to learn, as much as to teach. Their concern is real, because they have studied history, and history has demonstrated that power in the hands of men who abuse it and use it excessively leads to dictatorship and totalitarianism. On March 4th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of the Reich in Germany and Franklin Roosevelt, President of the United States. Hitler was the inheritor of a philosophy of authoritarianism, Prussian militarism. Franklin Roosevelt was the inheritor of the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, of the whole heritage of American freedom. And while both countries were ravaged with depression and political collapse, one Germany turned to dictatorship to find its way out. We turned to an expanded democracy, both political and economic, to find our way out. And I think the answer is in the heritage of the nation, in the traditions of the nation. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, the Constitution, you see, is written in the present tense. The Constitution is, is not just an item of paper for the archives. It's not just a piece of parchment. It's a, it's a living organism. It's as adaptable as your own body, and it changes as life itself changes. The key to the Constitution's flexibility lies in great part in the powers vested in the President. He is given many roles to play. For example, the president is chief executive. 
He proposes laws and sees that they are faithfully executed. It was Dwight Eisenhower who sent federal troops under command of a federal general to Little Rock, Arkansas, to force school integration, to carry out a Supreme Court order. The president is commander in chief. He is the civilian head of all our armed forces. Woodrow Wilson, for example, in World War I was the man that selected General Pershing, who was the commander of the armed forces, the expeditionary forces in Europe. And through General Pershing, Woodrow Wilson exercised command over the armed forces of the United States. I suppose no president in our history uh, has been in more direct control over the armed forces than uh, Franklin Roosevelt. The White House itself became uh, like a war room. Harry Truman, Commander-in-Chief, summarily removed General MacArthur, national hero. He not only removed a, a military officer from command, but he removed from command a popular political figure. The President is the head of state, and his officially designated Secretary for Foreign Affairs has no more authority than the President will give him. It is the President that outlines uh, what our policy will be and how it is to be implemented. He represents uh, our country, for example, in all international relations. I have requested this television time tonight to announce a major development in our efforts to build a lasting peace in the world. As I have pointed out on a number of occasions over the past three years, there can be no stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China and its 750 million people. That is why I have undertaken initiatives in several areas to open the door for more normal relations between our two countries. President uh, Kennedy uh, initiated his administration by a visit to Vienna, where he met with Chairman Khrushchev, uh, a very important international conference. It was a sort of a feeling out of, uh, of power relationships uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union through their chief spokesman. And it is now uh, believed that that uh, meeting may very well have influenced uh, the decision that Mr. Khrushchev had to ultimately make in the removal of the missiles from Cuba. The president's powers are not limited to those granted by the Constitution. Traditionally, he's either assumed powers not otherwise assigned or had powers thrust on him. He is the leader of his political party, and if he loses that control, he can find himself in trouble. The classic example was Andrew Johnson's successor to Abraham Lincoln. Johnson was the victim of a terrific battle within the Republican Party between the moderates and the radicals. And uh, Andrew Johnson had neither the force of character or the force of personality that could hold that party together. And the party turned to General Grant. The right to protest is inherent in the Constitution but not the right to disrupt the peace. And as guardian of domestic tranquility, one of the president's responsibilities is to keep public order. We saw the power of the presidency uh, exercised on, on the home scene uh, by uh, Herbert Hoover when uh, the bonus marchers came to Washington and he used American troops to disperse uh, uh, these veterans of uh, World War I. He did it in the name of preserving uh, domestic uh, tranquility. Whatever the president does or says has tremendous impact on the national economy. The president is responsible for the federal budget, and the federal budget has an immense impact upon the economic life of the nation. If the country suffers unemployment, it is frequently attributed to the lack of adequate program and policy of the president and his administration. If the country enjoys uh, prosperity and economic growth, the president is quick to claim credit for it. The president has a responsibility to adopt policies that would provide for maximum employment, maximum production, maximum purchasing power, and at the same time would lend themselves to economic growth and stability. So the president is head of state. He is chief executive. He proposes laws and sees that they're enforced. He is commander in chief the nation's diplomat, chief of party, voice of the people, protector of the peace.
But beyond the constitutional and traditional roles he plays, each occupant of the office leaves on it his own unique stamp of personality. Teddy Roosevelt used to say that the White House is a bully pulpit. By that he meant that the man that occupied it could be the conscience of the nation. could be the voice of redemption for the sins of the nation. And he looked upon the presidency in all of its aspects as a force for good, a force for reform. Woodrow Wilson looked upon the presidency in a little different manner. Woodrow Wilson said the White House is the nation's classroom and its occupant, the nation's teacher. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Merely by repeating the oath of office, the man becomes the institution. For its part, the institution takes on a new dimension and a new character because of what each new president brings to the office. So help you God. So help me God. But the trouble with that oath is that it says it all, but it says very little. There is no set formula, no recipe, no book that says, Mr. President, this is the way you do it under these particular circumstances. What happens is in part uh, from the nature of the man, how he sees the problem and how he comes to grips with it. Washington started out immediately to add new dimensions to the presidency, to describe it by action and by deeds rather than by written document. George Washington proclaimed the neutrality of the American nation in the French Revolution, even though many Americans in and out of government were very sympathetic with the revolutionaries. He proceeded to negotiate a treaty of peace with Great Britain, establishing, in other words, by precedent now and practice, the treaty-making power of the president. Now, Thomas Jefferson was surely one of our strong presidents. Imagine the audacity of a president of the United States to make a purchase of a vast area of, of the country to negotiate the purchase without even the consent of Congress, and then to present it as a fact to the Congress to pay the bill. Andrew Jackson developed by precedent and use uh, the presidential veto he vetoed the bill that would have authorized a private bank to, in a sense, speak for the United States uh, in monetary matters and established the authority of the presidency in terms of fiscal and monetary policy. Abraham Lincoln saw as his prime responsibility the preservation of the Union. It was uh, Abraham Lincoln who exercised the powers of commander-in-chief as no other president in the history of this country has ever exercised them the war powers of the president, the putting down of sedition and riot, the suspension of certain rights, uh, what we consider to be legal guarantees of privacy and of uh, individual liberty. Uh, Lincoln's declaration of known as the Emancipation Proclamation was the president simply saying that all the slaves were free, not an act of Congress, but just an exercise of both moral and political authority backed up by the armed forces of the United States. Theodore Roosevelt crusade against the trusts, against the economic power of the monopolists and of the, the managers of industry and finance. Uh, uh, his uh, negotiations over the Panama Canal would hardly stand the scrutiny of modern television and uh, congressional investigation. But he did it. He thought we needed it. Franklin Roosevelt, coming in at a time of economic collapse and almost political disintegration, took hold of the reins of government and began to use both the powers of the presidency under the Constitution and the precedent of previous presidents, but also the power of moral suasion. He made the struggle against the Depression like it was a conflict against a foreign enemy. Harry Truman surely demonstrated the powers of the presidency and the war powers when he used the atom bomb. And possibly this was the most powerful act of any president. His greatness is in the post-war years. And of course, I suppose the times lent themselves to it. Great decisions had to be made. The Truman Doctrine, the Berlin Airlift, the Marshall Plan, 
and our first peacetime military alliance, NATO. His decision to commit troops to Korea under the guise of UN sponsorship and direction. All of these things happened under Harry Truman. Dwight Eisenhower sent troops into the Middle East, into Lebanon, when it appeared that there might be an outbreak there that he felt would threaten the vital interests of the United States. A few hours ago, a battalion of United States Marines landed and took up stations in and about the city of Beirut. We are hopeful that the action which we are now taking will both preserve the independence of Lebanon and check international violations which, if they succeeded, would endanger world peace. We had John Kennedy committing this country to a comprehensive, long-range project in peace, a man on the moon in the decade of the 60s. This was something that touched the, the, uh, the hearts and the minds of the American people and grabbed their imagination, so to speak. They seized upon it, and it seized them. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Yo, honey, keep going, baby. No matter how inspiring a president may be, his authority to act is not unlimited he must work within the framework of three branches of the government, and each has power to restrain the others. Of the two branches of government, other than the executive, Congress has most effectively limited the exercise of presidential power. The president, in making appointments, is exercising one of the highest prerogatives of his office. Yet we have seen district court judges, circuit court judges, and here in recent years, two appointees to the Supreme Court, rejected by the Senate of the United States. The Congress frequently calls upon the President to make an annual report to the Congress of the United States. Congressional appropriations govern what the President can spend. The President must work within what we call the statutory laws of the country. Then there is always the power of the Congress to investigate every office of the executive branch of the government. There's the power of impeachment. Even the threat of impeachment is a limitation on presidential powers. And there's the power of a vote of censor, even upon members of the president's cabinet. A congressional minority can withhold consent to treaties. A congressional filibuster can stop action on presidential requests and on presidential programs. And obviously, amendments to the Constitution can affect the presidency. <laughs> The judicial branch can limit presidents too. It cannot question what a president does or order him to take or not take action. But the court can decide constitutional questions raised once he does take action. In the Youngstown Steel and Tube Company versus Sawyer, President Truman seized the steel industry, but not for long. A United States District Court judge said, you're wrong, release the steel industries, and the President of the United States did just that. I think this is a classic example of both the power of the presidency and the restraints upon it. There are other indirect and non-constitutional limitations, and they too can be very effective. The Federal Trade Commission is one of these what we call quasi-public bodies. The Federal Communications Commission, the Interstate Commerce Commission, these are agencies and instrumentalities. While their members are appointed by the president, they are not responsible to the president. They're responsible to the Congress. The president is also uh, limited at times in what he wants to do by the power that exists outside of government. The power of finance, of organized labor, organized business. The influence of lobbyists and pressure groups that work on public opinion. The organizations of many groups in our country. 
It was Abraham Lincoln, I think, who once said that he could do anything with public sentiment, but nothing without it or against it. But a man who has public sentiment with him one day does not own permanent title. In 1964, President Johnson's seeming popularity swept him back into office with an unprecedented plurality. Then, overnight, it all was changed. President Lyndon Johnson's decision first to send troops uh, into Vietnam and to increase troop strength and to escalate the bombing of North Vietnam was an example of strong presidential initiative and leadership, but it angered millions of Americans of all ages and all groups. And we saw demonstrations and riots and anti-war feelings uh, mounting in geometrical proportions. They mounted so high uh, that uh, he had to reassess his whole political situation. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. The fact of the matter is that a president can't do much over a long period of time unless he has the nation with him. Even so, uh, many Americans, and particularly our young people and our students, are terribly concerned over the power potential of the presidency, especially in the field of foreign affairs. And uh, we're beginning to ask, uh, is there no end to it? But there's another aspect of the presidency. It is an institution, an old institution. And I think uh, when viewed in the perspective of history, it will prove to be bigger and more durable than any one man. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. These are extraordinary times, and we face an extraordinary challenge. Our strength, as well as our convictions, have imposed upon this nation the role of leader in freedom's cause. We're striving for an ideal which is close to the heart of every American and for which in the past many Americans have laid down their lives. To serve these ideals is to serve the cause of peace, security and well-being, not only for us, but for all men everywhere. The president is more than a man. He represents the hopes, the ideals, the aspirations of a nation the people. He is the people's man, occupying the office for the people, not for himself. With adoption of the 26th Amendment, enabling 18 to 20 year olds to vote, more and more Americans today have a voice in determining what kind of people's man sits in the office. Young people with the vote may increasingly ask, how much power should one man, the president, have? Has the presidency in modern times become too powerful? Or is this necessary to keep up with new responsibilities, unknown and unconceived of at the founding of the Republic? What do you think?